Africa's animal oasis. And now, our feature presentation. The heart of Africa surges with life. Its red-hot blood explodes onto the surface, piling up forest-clad volcanoes and raising glacier-hewn mountains high. Clouds gather about their shoulders, pulling rain from the skies and watering a vast floodplain covered by rainforest. Great chasms yawn where the earth is torn asunder by a great rift. Rainwater spills off the highlands, descending by spectacular leaps to the deep places of Africa's heart. Fresh water plummets into the abyss, forming a string of great lakes, inland seas of majesty and wonder. The greatest of them all is Tanganyika. For 10 million years, this cauldron of creation has been brewing new life. From small brown fish have come a treasure trove of living gems, each dancing to a different beat living every lifestyle you can imagine, and many which you can't. As diverse as they are, they share a common concern for their young, which they've taken to extravagant extremes. They dominate lake life, playing every role, feeding a huge cast of supporting players. Tanganyika is home to one of the evolutionary wonders of the world. From little fish in deep water have come living jewels of the rift. Lake Tanganyika is a 400-mile-long tear in the fabric of Africa. It is a creation of the Great Rift, a system of cracks where the Earth's crust has split. The Great Rift sprawls across Africa's living heart, stretching 3,500 miles along faults where tectonic plates are splitting the continent. Mountains soar where molten rock wells up. Valley floors fall away, creating a necklace of lakes. Tanganyika is the largest of these, forming a border between four nations. It's perhaps the oldest and certainly the deepest lake in Africa. The earth yawned and Tanganyika grew. It has slowly filled with sediment, which covers its bottom in a layer nearly three miles thick. Still, it is almost a mile deep, but its depths are lifeless, devoid of oxygen and well beyond the reach of light. Only its surface waters, alternately tossed by storms and illuminated by the tropical sun, have been charged with life. As soon as the lake was born, the forces of evolution began molding new creatures especially suited to life here. Early colonizers came from the rivers which filled the lake, 
Among them were ones that, millions of years later, would come to dominate it. Tanganyika's new masters were not as powerful as the crocodile, nor as adorable as the otter, but they were destined for success. They were unassuming little fish called cichlids, and they became everyone's favorites. Unlikely empire builders, they were little fish with guts and a talent for adaptation. They gave rise to more than 200 species that evolved here. The cichlid empire is built on intelligence, adaptability, and a surprising degree of parental care for their young. No one knows when the first cichlids appeared here, but they found few competitors. Tanganyika was the empty stage upon which they performed their evolutionary wonders. Random mutations provided the raw material out of which new species were fashioned. From simple forebears, more specialized cichlids arose, each with its own way of life. The largest of them all, the emperor cichlid, is as long as your arm, 5,000 times the size of the smallest cichlid, which is no bigger than your thumbnail. Differences in size, habit, and color allow species to coexist. Color is surprisingly important. Cichlids use it to distinguish one species from another. Iridescent hues help females select a mate of the right kind. The importance of color in mate selection may even help to explain how so many species of cichlids could have evolved so quickly. A simple change in color could be the first step in the creation of a new species. Different kinds of rock razor cichlids are distinguished by different colored bands. Here, they're red and white. Rock grazers don't like to leave the protective cover of their rocky lairs. The creation of a sandy beach, piled here by a storm, can split a single population in two and restrict movement between the groups for years. When a new color pattern appears in one group and is favored by the females there when selecting a mate, the difference in color alone could keep red and white and yellow banded rock grazers from interbreeding when they meet again. Adaptable jaws have also helped the cichlids create new species. Cichlids actually have two sets of jaws. The inner one mashes food, leaving the outer one free to evolve specialized teeth, which help them gather every kind of food imaginable. Fine-toothed rasps are for grazing algae. Interlocking spike teeth arm this barracuda cichlid. Miniature chisels provide precise picking for a goby cichlid. And no small fish could wriggle free from the spine tooth trap of a mackerel cichlid. But the function of some teeth is hardly to be believed. This fish is a predator. Its bold black and white banding mimics the coloration of the species upon which it preys. Still another kind of cichlid. It is a classic con artist, dressing like its victims to get in close before ripping them off. Luckily for the prey, it eats only their scales. It's a sophisticated predator, 
where its prey is not killed, but merely grazed. The victim's scales will soon grow back and can be grazed again. The cichlid's multi-purpose mouth is also a weapon. Opponents first size each other up. If one's mouth is smaller, he'll back down without risking injury. But if they're well matched, they'll engage in mouth-to-mouth -mouth combat. But the cichlid's versatile mouth is not only used to feed or fight. It can be a nursery as well. Mouth brooding is an amazing form of parental care. All cichlids share a deep concern for their young, another key to their success. A cormorant plunges through Tanganyika's crystalline water. There are so many cichlids here that eat algae, it rarely gets a chance to cloud the lake's liquid vistas. Predator and prey play out their chase in water as clear as mountain air. Life in the lake is built upon the flock of cichlid species that arose from their generalist ancestors. But while they diverged wildly, others have not. The freshwater puffer has been here just as long as the cichlids, but has remained virtually unchanged. Shellfish are its passion. Its mouth has been transformed into a powerful beak, the better to crunch crabs with. But even with a bite taken out of it, this one fights back. Puffers were highly specialized even before Lake Tanganyika was created. They evolved in the rivers that fed into the new lake. That they've endured so long is testimony to the success of their design. But specialist designs are difficult to change, and they were unsuited to taking over the Virgin Lake. Unable to adapt to living in the lake itself, the puffer survives only as long as it stays in its river delta home. A clawless otter prefers catching crabs to fish, but it finds the slow-moving puffer irresistible. but the puffer's apparent vulnerability is misleading. Inflating itself like a balloon makes it much too large to swallow and raises thousands of tiny prickles. No manner of acrobatics can persuade it to deflate. Inflating is another specialized trait, essential to the puffer's survival and to the otter's as well. 
puffer fish have poisonous gallbladders, which could kill the otter should he eat it. Africa's early European explorers thought of this great lake as an endless sea. With the opposite shore out of sight, and with waves pounding its coastline, only the water's taste testifies to its true origin. The surf is fresh. Tanganyika's resemblance to the sea extends well beneath the surface. The first naturalists found shells here they believed had originated in the ocean, and they proposed that the lake had once been connected to it. Jellyfish, among others, certainly seem to have been spirited here from the sea. In fact, the lake has never been a part of the ocean, but over millions of years, animals have come to resemble marine creatures because they evolved under similar conditions. The lake even has its own sardines. And when they come inshore to spawn, the feast is on. Terns also feed on the spawning sardines, completing the picture of a landlocked sea. But their predators aren't creatures of the deep. Pythons, though, love the water. Many a turn will succumb to this horrible embrace. Swallowing that sharp beak may prove as difficult as catching the bird in the first place.
A belly bulge is all that remains of a spirited creature of the air. Birds can be efficient predators in their own right. Well, sometimes. A vulture is not really cut out for plucking fish from the waves. But the density of cichlids here is so high, about the same as that of a well-stocked aquarium, that even vultures have been known to try their luck. And there are birds here which are consummate fishermen. The quicksilver pursuit of the cormorant often ends a cichlid's life. But cichlids are among the most intelligent of fish and are always challenging game. Not all those who feast on cichlids have feathers or fins. Spot-necked otters dry their luxurious fur coats, rubbing against rocks heated by the tropical sun. They are among the best swimmers of their kind, but it takes teamwork to catch the clever and speedy cichlids. With feet webbed for speed and claws for holding on to their catch, spot-necked otters are well suited for catching cichlids. But there is one cichlid that has evolved a way to escape even this crack team. Having narrowly escaped, the cichlid hides in a tiny crevice in a log. Perplexed by this disappearing act, the otters continue to search until they find the fish. But finding it is not the same as catching it. The fish flexes its body, wedging itself fast with its rough scales.
No matter how hard the artists try, they cannot pry it free. When the autos go up for air, the fish simply relaxes, lets go its grip, and scoots away. That game is over, but the otters soon spot an emperor cichlid and give chase. But in open water, the emperor easily evades them, and he's too busy to play. He and his mate have come into the shallows to spawn. These tiny globes contain the future of their parents' evolutionary line, but they're also packets of high-energy nourishment, perfect food for other cichlids. For the next few weeks, the emperors cannot afford to drop their guard for a second, or even take time out to eat. The egg thieves are always waiting. Even while they keep the larger cichlids at bay, tiny sneak thieves get by and one by one, the clutch is nibbled away. A water beetle's browsing is even more serious. It devours eggs as if popping bubble wrap. It may be its shape or its clumsy swimming, but whatever the reason, the emperor does not seem to recognize it as a threat. It should be easy for this armored heavyweight to get some cichlid caviar. Weighing in at 15 pounds, the terrapin is three times heavier than the parents. But a pair of cichlids defending their young is a force to be reckoned with. That's enough for the terrapin. There must be an easier meal to be had somewhere in this great lake. But this is clearly not the terrapin's day. The otters are still about, and always on the lookout for some fun. But they soon tire of their reluctant playmate. Finally, the terrapin's luck has turned. It's found a dead emperor, but even dead, it proves too much to handle. And there will be no second chance at it.
An osprey spotted the emperor from on high, but the fish is so heavy that the hawk cannot get airborne with his prize, so it simply swims to high ground. A lost opportunity and a found feast. The ability to take advantage of such chance opportunities is a key to evolutionary success. This little snail presents cichlids with just such an opportunity but only after the snail itself has died. Their shells can occur in the millions, covering acres of lake bed. As many as 20 tiny cichlids have evolved to fit into the shells, using them as both a refuge from predators and a spawning site. This cichlid is courting. The females of his kind are small enough to fit inside the shells, but the male is far too large. All he can do is squirt his sperm into the entrance. The female will raise her brood in the safety of her shell, while the male must cope with the dangerous world outside. But there is a definite advantage to being so big. He picks up shells to pick up females. Passing females are escorted by the male to his collection of shells. He shows off the accommodations, inviting her to move in. The more shells he has, the more females he can house in his harem. But building a harem from scratch is tiring and time-consuming. It's easier to raid those nearby, plundering shells and kidnapping females. For the many different cichlids who evolved into miniatures, these shells provide a haven but just occasionally, they can become traps. The water cobra has evolved here in Tanganyika alongside the cichlids, and for the first year of its life, it is small enough to get inside the shells. Already, its venom is as potent as an adult's. One bite could kill a human. Millions of years ago, the cobra left the land to hunt in the lake and now feeds almost entirely on fish. Water cobras are not the most serious threat to this cichlid's harem. He is surrounded, but not by his females. They're tucked inside their shells. His harem is being raided by midget males. While the harem master evolved into a giant, some males of the same species stay tiny and mimic the females. These transvestite dwarves, too puny to collect shells themselves, try to sneak a mating where they can. Ganging together increases their chances, 
They're so small, they can fit inside the shells and mate the females undisturbed. The success of their raids bonds the tiny males to each other, and the gang turns their mob tactics to another pressing concern, filling their bellies. The young of whole nesting cichlids are ideal prey for the mob. Parents will fight to protect their young, but the sheer number of raiders can easily overwhelm them. As the mob approaches a colony of whole nesters, the vigilant parents flash their fins, signaling their brood to retreat to the deepest part of the nest. In the middle of the colony, defending parents from all sides keep the raiders on the move. All the mob can do is hit and run. But nests at the edge of the colony are at serious risk. A whole brood can be devoured in a matter of seconds. A parent's valiant defense of its young is not really what you expect from a fish. But cichlids feel the bonds of family strongly. The emperors have stepped up their defense now that their eggs have hatched. But the mob is quick to join forces with other thieves if it means a chance at an emperor's nest. The giant cichlid will dig out a hole, using that versatile mouth as both shovel and bucket. Then it moves its wriggling brood to safety, mouthful by mouthful. Taking their young into their mouths was a small evolutionary step. Keeping them there was a breakthrough. It combined the cichlid's best asset, that adaptable mouth, with their greatest talent caring for their young. The results have been amazing. As both nest and nursery, mom's mouth proved to be the safest place in the lake. For as long as a month, mothers will shelter their young this way, protecting them during the most vulnerable times of their lives. Mouth brooding has been so successful that over a thousand species of cichlids everywhere now raise their young this way. A pair spawns, the colorful male and plain female stimulating each other towards this consummate act. As soon as she lays a few eggs, the mother sucks them up. So eager is she to get them into the safety of her mouth, she leaves little time for the male to fertilize them. So the male flashes his egg dummies, bright patches of color on his fin that mimic the female's own eggs. She tries in vain to pick them up, and each time she does, she gets a mouthful of sperm instead. By the time she tires, all her eggs will have been fertilized, internally, but in her mouth. 
Mouth brooding is an elegant solution to the cichlid obsession for safeguarding their young. But in the evolutionary arms race, there are always those who try to turn the best laid plans of others to their own benefit. These catfish have evolved into parasites of mouth brooders. Each time the mouth brooders start to spawn, catfish swarm in to eat their eggs. Mouth brooder eggs are the perfect food, extra large and yolky. But the catfish aren't just eating eggs, they're also dropping their own. They're exploiting the female cichlid's eagerness to pick up eggs, for she gathers up the catfish eggs along with her own. Unknowingly, she is committing herself to a horrible sort of surrogate motherhood. The catfish depart, never knowing what becomes of their own young. Inside her mouth, the catfish hatch first. Armed with cavernous mouths and voracious appetites, the catfish turn on the cichlid fry, devouring them alive. By the time she's ready to release her young, the deceit is complete. All that remain are a few very fat young catfish. For the catfish, the cichlid is the only mother they will ever know. The female mouth brooder also fails to recognize the switch. She treats the little catfish tenderly as if they were her own, oblivious to the fact that they ate each and every one of her own offspring. She scoops them up to protect them at the first hint of danger. As much as she might like to, she cannot mother them for long. While feasting in the dark, the young catfish not only grew plump, they grew spines. The spines lock fast, designed to jam in a predator's mouth and protect the slow-swimming catfish. Even at this age, the spines prevent the young catfish from becoming morsels for the mob. Evolution is like three-dimensional chess with all the pieces moving at once. Just as the catfish came up with an ideal fostering scheme, some cichlids developed ways to counter it. Here, a male builds a sandcastle on top of a rock. Within its walls, he is out of sight of any catfish below. Once he finishes the final touches to his mating arena, he dances to entice a female into it. As they circle in a mating dance, the female releases her eggs. The male swirls his sperm down into the bowl-like depression as the female picks the eggs up. By mouth brooding, cichlids give their eggs and tiny fry a head start in life. Crabs here have evolved to do much the same. In Lake Tanganyika, anything a parent can do to delay its infant's entry into this predatory world is beneficial. When their eggs hatch, 
Female crabs normally set their larvae adrift to take their chances. But here, there are so many hungry mouths ready to devour them that this crab holds on to her larvae instead. They bypass the free swimming stage altogether, turning straight into tiny crabs, tucked snugly within the safety of her shell. Though she is willing to protect her young with her life, she cannot guarantee their safety when her own is at risk. A clawless otter is on the prowl. The otter cannot see very well, especially amid clouds of sediment. It hunts mainly by feel anyway, exploring with dexterous hands. To catch and manipulate prey, sensitive fingers are matched against flexible thumbs. Compared to spot-necked otters, a clawless otter is less at home in the lake. It prefers rivers and swamps. But it does hunt here occasionally, for the crabs are bigger. So much bigger, that every time the otter finds one, it must weigh the prospect of a meal against the risk of damage to itself. In nature, any course of action entails some risk. Even sex is not without its hazards. This is a lek, a cluster of tiny courtship territories which females visit to select a mate. In the spawning season, male flashers come up from deep water to display in these arenas. It's like Muscle Beach, as the males show off their pectorals and pelvic fins. They display to attract females and impress neighboring males. To have any chance of breeding, they must shine out in the crowd. Females choose the most brilliant flashers, so there is pressure to display in the shallows where there is more light. The males flutter on their sides to reflect the light and to catch a female's eye. But it's an evolutionary gamble. Often, it's not just a female's attention that is caught. A giant kingfisher takes advantage of the flasher's catch-22. Move and counter-move. Evolution is a game of survival. A creative force that enlivens Tanganyika's crystalline waters. But there is one predator in the lake against which cichlids have evolved no defense. With feeble fins, bilious skin, and piggy eyes, it's not much of a looker. But in its own way, it's stunning. It's an electric catfish. It uses its muscle power not for speed, but to generate electricity it needs to get in close to knock out its prey. Each time it convulses, it delivers a shock. The victim has no defense against a 300-volt jolt, although some cichlid is probably working on it. The electric catfish has little fear of predators itself, 
but an otter has yet to be born that can knowingly swim past a fish. What looked like a meal turns out to be a course of shock therapy. It is eight days since the Emperor spawned, and their tiny fry are now free swimming and hungry. It's time to go. It is the moment the mob has waited for. The next few minutes will be the most dangerous in the tiny fry's lives. Despite the marauders, the fry must stay close to their protective parents. Perhaps one in 10,000 will survive to return and breed as an adult. Then, suddenly, the attackers disappear. Something has enticed them away, something which unites the cichlid empire. The emperors watch as the schools of cichlids gather awaiting the coming feast. This night, millions of sardine fry will leave the safety of the rocks and make a mad dash for deep water. They have been hiding since they hatched, but tonight they come together in a huge school, smothering the reef. Only luck and the weight of their overwhelming numbers will see them through this gauntlet. However specialized cichlids have become in the past 10 million years, for an hour it is forgotten. They all revert to the habits of their opportunist ancestors, which colonized the lake so long ago. The readiness to take advantage of opportunities is a defining feature of cichlids. The ability to create their own is even more so. The Emperor's Fry need not run for the relative safety of the deep. They are escorted by devoted parents who will protect them. The bonds between parent and tiny offspring and between male and female are part of the genius of the cichlid line. Lake Tanganyika, jewel of the rift, is as deep and blue as the African sky. Beneath its waves hide its living gems. Blessed with a talent for adaptation and capable of extraordinary parental care, these little fish are doing what their ancestors did millions of years ago. They are gambling for immortality. They are the latest chapter in an ancient saga the next generation of little fish in deep water.
We hope you have enjoyed this presentation from the National Geographic Video Library.